This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, see LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce Recording by Hugh McGuire, Mike Trevino, Jenny Collins, Colin Robertson, Andrew Skinner, Alan Espen, Wilson Blakeman, Ulysses, Part One. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Introibo ad alteri dei. Halted, he peered down the dark, winding stairs and called up coarsely. Come up, Kinch! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the ground. Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round gunrest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding country and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight, of Stephen Dedalus. He bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. <clears throat> Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, equine in its length, and at the light, untonsured hair, grained and hued like pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror, and then covered the bowl smartly. Back to barracks, he said sternly. He added in a preacher's tone, For this, O oh dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine. Body and soul, blood and wounds. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscules. Silence all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, low whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysotomos. Two strong, shrill whistles answered through the calm. Thanks, old chap, he cried briskly. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? <clears throat> he skipped off the gunrest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump shadowed face and the sullen oval jaw recalled a prelate, patron of arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. The mockery of it, he said gaily, your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly dress. <laughs> he pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over to the parapet, laughing to himself. Stephen Dedalus stepped up, followed him wearily halfway and sat down on the edge of the gunrest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl and lathered his cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. <coughs> My name is absurd too. Malachi Mulligan. Two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the ant to fork out twenty quid? 
He laid the brush aside and, laughing with delight, cried, Will he come, the jejun Jesuit? Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan, Stephen said quietly. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful, he said frankly. A ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English, bursting with money and indigestion. Because he comes from Oxford, you know, Dedalus. You have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun case? A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said, with energy and growing fear. <clears throat> Out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther? You saved men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on here, I am off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scudder, he cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Lend us a loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty, crumpled hand handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, The bard's nose rag, a new art color for our Irish poets. It's not green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak-pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, isn't the sea what algae calls it, a grey sweet mother? The snot-green sea, the scrotum-tightening sea, epionipa panton. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks, I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata, she is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat clearing the harbour mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his great searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch. When you were dying, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm hyperborean as much as you. But to think your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her? And you refused. There's something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again slightly, his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely murmur, he murmured to himself. Kinch, the loveliest murmur of them all. He shaved evenly with care in silence, seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his bow, and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain. That was not yet the pain of love, fretted his heart. Silently in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body within its loose brown grave's clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath, that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge, he saw... The sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the wealthed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of china and had stood beside her deathbed, holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning, vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. How are the second-hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it, he said contentedly. 
Second length they should be. God knows what poxy bowsy left them off. I have a lovely pair with a hair striped grey. You'll look spiffing in them. I'm not joking, Kinch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they're grey. He can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear grey trousers. He folded his razor neatly, and with stroking palps of finger felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night, said Buck Mulligan. Say you have GPI, he's up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman. General paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror a half circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight now radiant on the sea. His curling shaven lips laughed and the edges of his white glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong well-knit trunk. Look at yourself, he said. You dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by a crook cracked on end. As he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog body to rid of vermin? It asked me to. I pinched it out of the skivvy's room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The aunt always keeps pains looking servants for Malachi. Lead him not into temptation. And her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban had not seen his face in a mirror, he said. If while they were only alive to see you, drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, it is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stephen's and walked with him round the tower. His, <clears throat> his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had trust them. It's not fair to tease you like that, Rick. Whoops. <clears throat> Shut up, I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's not fair to tease you like that, Kinch, is it? He said kindly. God knows you have more spirit than any of them. Pirate again. He fears the lancet of my art as I fear that of his, the coal steel pen. <clears throat> Cracked looking glass of a servant. Tell that to the oxy shop downstairs and touch him for a guinea. He's thinking with money and thinks you're not a gentleman. His old fellow made his tin by selling jalap to, to, to Zulus or some bloody swindle or other. God, Kinch, if you and I could only work together, we might do something for the highland. Illy nice. Illy nice. Crankly, Cran Cranley's arms his arm. And to think of your having to beg from these swine. I'm the only one that knows where, what you are. Why don't you trust me more? What have you up your nose against me? Is it Ains? If he makes any noise here, it will bring down Seymour and will give him a rage, raging war. Oof. I'll... Oof. If he makes any noise... Here, if, <laughs> if he makes any noise here, I'll bring down Seymour. We'll give him a raging worse than they gave Clive Kemp. <laughs> I'm going to skip it. <laughs> Young shouts of monade voices in Clive Kemp Torp's rooms. <laughs> Pallet faces, they hold their ribs with laughter, one clasping another. Oh, I shall expire. Break the news her gently, Obrey. I shall die. With slip ribbons of his shirt whipping the air, he ups and hobbles around the table. With trousers down at heels, chased by Addis of Magdalen, 
with the trailers, the tailors, <laughs> with the tailors shears. Oh, I can't go through all this. I can't go through all this. Was it through? Yeah. <laughs> we'll come back. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A scared calf's face, gilded with marmalade. I don't want to be debagged. Don't you play the giddy ox with me. Shouts from the open window. Startling evening in the quadrangle. A deaf gardener, aproned, masked with Matthew Arnold's face, pushes his mower on the somber lawn, watching narrowly the dancing motes of grass elms. To ourselves, new paganism. Omphalos. Let him stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him except at night. Then what is it? Buck Milligan asked impatiently. Cough it up. I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Bry Head that lay on the water like the snout of a sleeping whale. Stephen freed his arm quietly. Do you wish me to tell you? He asked. Yes, what is it? Buck Mulgan answered. I don't remember anything. He looked in Stephen's face as he spoke. A light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair, uncombed hair and, st and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, Do you remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quickly and said, What? Where? I, I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said, and I went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked you who was in your room. Yes, Buck Mulligan said. What did I say? I forget. You said, Stephen answered, Oh, it's only Daedalus whose mother is heartly dead. You said, Stephen answered, Oh, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. A flush with ma which made him seem younger and more engaging rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that, he asked? Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death, he asked. Your mother's, or yours, or my own? You saw, you saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the matter in Richmond and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on her deathbed when she asked you. Why? Because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected the wrong way. To me, it's all a mockery and a beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor Sir, Pe Sir Petal Teasel and picks buttercups off the quilt. Her, hu humor her till it's over. You crossed her last... You, humor her till it's over. You crossed her last wish in death and yet you sulk with me because I don't whinge like some hired mute from La Louette's. Absurd! I suppose I did say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, shielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I am not thinking of the offence to my mother. Of what then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offence to me, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung around on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. He walked off quickly round the parapet, Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, veiling their sight, and he felt the fever of his cheeks.
A voice within the tower called loudly. Are you there, Mulligan? I'm coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offenses? Chuck Loyola, Kinch, and come on down. The Sausage wants his morning rashers. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. Don't mope, all, don't mope over it all the day, he said. I'm inconsequent. Give up the moody brooding. His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed out over the star head. And no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery, for Fargus rules the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and further out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light-shot hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea. The twinning stresses, two by two. A hand plucking the hamp strings, merging their twinning cords. Wave-white wedded words shimmering on the dim tide. A cloud began to, cl to cover the sun slowly, shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay behind him a bowl of bitter waters. Fergus's song. I sang it alone in the house, holding down the long, dark chords. Her door was open. She wanted her music, silent with awe and pity. I went to her bedside. She was crying in her wretched bed. For those words, Stephen... Love's bitter mystery. Where now? Her secrets, old feather fans, tasseled dance cards, powdered with musk, a god of amber beads in her locked drawer. A birdcage hung in the sunny window of her house where she, when she was a girl. She heard old Royce singing in the pantomime of Turco the terrible and laughed with others when, she, when he sang, I am the boy that can enjoy invisibility. Phantasmal mirth, folded away, musk perfumed. And no more turn aside and brood. Folded away in the memory of nature with her toys, memories beset her brooding brain, her glass of water from the kitchen tap when she approached from the sacrament, a cored apple filled with brown sugar, roasting for her at the hob of the, on the dark autumn evening, her shapely fingernails reddened by the by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. In a dream, silently, she'd come to him, her wasted body within its loose grave clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath bent over him with mute secret words, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes staring out of death to shake and bend my soul. On me alone, the ghost candle to light her agony ghostly light on the tortured face, her hoarse, loud breath rattling in horror, while all prayed on her knees, her eyes on me to strike me down, Lilata ritunlinum, to confess, confessorum, terma circumerit, imbiolatinum, te virginum, chorus expatidit. Gow, chewer of corpses! No, mother, let me be and let me live! Kinch ahoy! Buck Mulligan's voice sang from, the, from within the tower. It came nearer up the staircase, calling again. Stephen, still trembling at his soul's cry, heard warm running sunlight in the air behind him friendly words. To Dallas, come now. Come down like a good mosey. Breakfast is ready. Haynes is apologizing for waking us last night. It's all right. I'm coming, Stephen said, turning. Do for Jesus' sake, Buck Mulligan said, for my sake and for all our sakes. His head disappeared and reappeared. I told him your symbol of Irish art. He says it's very clever. Touch him for a quid, will you? A guinea, I mean. I get paid this morning, Stephen said. The school kip? Buck Mulligan said. How much? Four quid? Lend us one. If you want, Stephen said. Four shining sovereigns, Buck Mulligan cried with delight, will have a glorious drunk to astonish the druidy druids. Four omnipotent so sovereigns. 
He flung up his hands and tramped down the, stown, the stone stairs, singing out of a tune with a cockney accent. Oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer, and wine on Coronation, Coronation Day. And don't we have a merry time on Coronation Day. Warm sunshine marrying over the sea. The nickel shaving bowl shone forgotten on the parapet. Why should I bring it down or leave it there all day, forgotten friendship? He went over to it, held it in his hands a while, feeling its coolness, smelling the calmy solver of the lather in which the brush was struck. in which the brush was stuck. So I carried the boat of incense then to, to <laughs> Glongawas. I am another now and yet the same, a servant too, a server of the servant. In the gloomy doomed living room of the tower, Buck Mulligan groaned from, from move brisk, uh, for moved briskly about the hearth to and fro, hiding and revealing its yellow glow. Two shafts of soft daylight fell across the flag floor from the high barbic barbicans, and at the meeting of their rays a cloud of coal smoke and fumes of fried grease floated, turning. We'll be choked, Buck Mulligan said. Haynes opened that door. Will ya? Haynes opened that door, will ya? Stephen laid the shaving bowl on the locker. A tall figure rose from the hammock where it had been sitting, went to the doorway, and pulled open the inner doors. Have you the key? A voice asked. Dedalus has it, Buck Mulligan said. Janie Mack, I'm choked, he howled without looking up from the fire. Kinch! It's in the lock, Stephen said, coming forward. The key scraped around, scraped around harshly twice and, when the heavy door had been set ajar, welcome light and bright air entered. Haynes stood at the doorway looking out. Stephen hailed his unended valise to the, to the table and sat down to wait. Buck Mulligan tossed the fry onto the dish beside him. Then he carried the dish and a large teapot over to the table, set them down heavily, and sighed with relief. A melton, he said, as the candle remarked when, but hush, not a word more on the subject. Kitch, wake up. Bread, butter, honey, Haynes, come in. The grub is ready. Bless us, O oh Lord, and thy gifts. Where's the sugar? O oh, Jay, there's no milk. Stephen fetched the loaf and the pot from pot of honey from the butter cooler from the locker. Buck Mulligan sat down in a sudden pet. What sort of kip is this, he said. I told her to come after eight. We can drink it black, Stephen said. There's a lemon in the locker. Oh, damn you and your Paris fads, Buck Mulligan said. I want Sandy Cove milk. Haynes came in from the doorway and said quietly, that woman is coming up with the milk. The blessings with you, the blessings of God on you, Buck Mulligan cried, jumping up from his chair. Sit down. Pour out, pour out the tea there. The sugar is in the bag. Here, I can't go fumbling at the damn eggs. He hacked through the fry on the dish and slapped it out on three plates, saying, In nomine patres et fili et spiritus sancti. Haines sat down to pour out the tea. I'm giving you two lumps each, he said, but I say Mulligan, you do make strong tea, don't you? Buck Mulligan, hewing thick slices of loaf, said in an old woman's wheedling voice, When I makes tea, I makes tea, as my old grandmother Grogan said. And when I makes water, I makes water. By Jove, it is tea, Haines said. Buck Mulligan went on, hewing and wheedling. So do I, Miss Kyle, says she. Be God, ma'am, says Kyle. God send you, don't make them in the one pot. He lunged forward towards messmates, in turn a, six, a thick slice of bread impaled in his knife. That's folks, he said very earnestly, for your book, Haynes, five lines of text and ten pages of notes about the folk and the fish gods of Dundrum, printed by the weird sisters in the ear of the big wind. He turned to Stephen and asked in a fine puzzled voice, lifting his brows, can you recall, brother, is mother's grogan's 
tea and water pot spoken of in Mabigon's, or is it in Up <laughs> Upanishad's? I doubt it, said Stephen gravely. Do you now, Buck Mulligan said in the same tone. Your reasons, pray? I fancy, Stephen said, as he ate, it did not exist in or out of the Mabigon. <laughs> Mother Groggins was, one imagines, a kinswoman of Marianne. Buck Mulligan's face smiled with delight. Charming, he said in a finical, sweet voice, showing his white teeth and blinking his eyes pleasantly. Do you think she was quite charming? Then, suddenly, overclouding all his features, he growled in a hoarsened, rasping voice as he hewed again vigorously at the loaf. For old Marianne, she doesn't care a damn, but hissing up her petticoats. He crammed his mouth as fry and munched and droned. The doorway was darkened in by an entering form. The milk, sir. Come in, ma'am, Mulligan said. Kinch, get the jug. An old woman came forward and stood by Stephen's elbow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely morning, sir, she said. Glory be to God. <laughs> to whom? Mulligan said, glancing at her. <laughs> To who, Mulligan? <laughs> to who, Mulligan said, glancing at her. Ah, uh, to be sure. Stephen reached back and took the milk jug from the locker. The Islanders, Mulligan said to Haynes casually, speak frequently of the collector of prepuces. How much, sir? asked the old woman. A quart, Stephen said. He watched her pour into the measure and then... <coughs> into the jug, rich white milk, not hers. Old shrunken paps. She poured again a measure full. <laughs> and a tilly. Old and secret, she had entered from a morning world, maybe a messenger. She praised the goodness of the milk, pouring it out. Crouching by a patient cow at daybreak in the lush field, a witch on her toadstool, her wrinkled fingers quick at the squirting dugs. They lowered about her whom they knew, do silky cattle. Silk of the kind and poor old woman, names given her in old times. A wandering crone, lowly form of an immortal serving, her conqueror and her gay betrayer. Their common, their common cook queen, a messenger from the secret morning. To serve or to upbraid, whether he could not tell, but scorn to beg her favor. "'Tis indeed, ma'am," Buck Mulligan said, boring, pouring milk into their cups. "'Taste it, sir,' she said. Uh. He drank at her bidding. "'If we could only live on good food like that,' he said to her somewhat loudly, "'we wouldn't have the country full of rotten teeth and rotten guts. "'Living in a bog swamp, eating cheap food in the streets paved with dust, "'horse dung and consumptive spits. "'Are you a medical student, sir?' The old woman asked. I am, ma'am, Buck Mulligan answered. Stephen listened in a scornful silence. She bows her old head to a voice that speaks to her loudly. Her bone setter, her medicine man, me she slights. To the voice they will shrive and oil for the grave all there is of her but her woman's unclean loins. Of man's flesh may not in God's likeness the serpent's prey. And to the loud voice that now bids her be silent with wondering and steady eyes. Do you understand what he? Do you understand what he says? Stephen asked her. Is it French you are talking, sir? The old woman said to Haynes. Haynes spoke to her again a longer speech, confidently. Irish, Buck Mulligan said. Is there Gaelic on you? I thought it was Irish, she said, by the sound of it. Are you from the west, sir? I'm an Englishman, Haynes answered. He's English, Buck Mulligan said, and he thinks we ought to speak Irish in Ireland. 
Sure we ought to, the old one said, and I'm ashamed I don't speak the language myself. I'm told it's a grand language by them that knows. Grand is no name for it, said Buck Mulligan. Wonderful entirely. Fill us out some more tea, Kinch. Would you like a cup, ma'am? No, thank you, sir, the old man said, slipping the ring of the milk can on her forearm and about to go. Haynes said to her, Have you your bill? We had better pay her, Mulligan, hadn't we? Stephen filled the three cups. Bill, sir, she said, halting. Well, it's seven mornings, a pint, a two pence, is seven twos, is a shilling, and two pence over in these three mornings. And a quart at four pence is three quarts, is a shilling, and one and two is two and two, sir. Buck Mulligan sighed, and having filled his mouth with a crust thickly buttered on both sides, stretched forth his legs and began to search his trouser pockets. Pay up and look pleasant, Haynes said to him, smiling. Stephen filled a third cup and a spoonful of tea coloring faintly the thick, rich milk. Buck Mulligan brought up a florin, twisted it round in his fingers and cried, A miracle! He passed it along the table towards the woman, saying, Ask nothing more of me, sweet. All I can give you, I give. Stephen laid the coin in her uneager hand. We'll owe two pence, he said. Time enough, sir, she said, taking the coin. Time enough. Good morning, sir. She curtsied and went out, followed by Buck Mulligan's tender chant. Heart of my heart, word more, more would be laid at your feet. He turned to Stephen and said, Seriously, Dedalus, I'm stony. Hurry out to your school kip and bring us back some money. Today the bards must drink and junk it. Ireland expects that every man this day will do his duty. Okay. That reminds me, Haynes said. <laughs> Rising. That I have to visit your national library today. Our swim first, Buck Mulligan said. He turned to Stephen and asked blandly, Is this the day of your monthly wash, Kinch? Then he said to Haynes, The unclean bard makes a point of washing once a month. All Ireland is washed by the Gulf Stream, Stephen said, as he let honey trickle over his slice of the loaf. Haynes from the corner, where he was knotting easily a scarf about the loose collar of his tennis shirt, spoke. I intend to make a collection of your saving sayings, if you will let me. Speaking to me, they wash and tub and scrub. A genbite of inwit, conscience. Yet there's a spot. That one about the crackled looking-glass of a servant being the symbol of Irish art is deuced good. Buck Mulligan kicked Stephen's foot under the table and said with a warmth tone, Wait till you hear him on Hamlet, Haynes. Well, I mean it, Haynes said, still speaking to Stephen. I was just thinking of it when the poor old creature came in. Would I make money by it? Stephen asked. Haynes laughed and, as he took his soft gray hat from the holdfast of the hammock, said, I don't know, I'm sure. He strolled out to the doorway. Buck Mulligan bent across to Stephen and said with coarse vigor, You put your hoof in it now. What did you say that for? Well, Stephen said, the problem is to get money. From whom? From the milkwoman or from him? It's a toss-up, I think. I blow him out about you, Buck Mulligan said, 
and then you come along with your lousy leer and your gloomy Jesuit jibes. I see little hope, Stephen said, from her or from him. Buck Mulligan sighed tragically and laid his hand on Stephen's arm. From me, Kinch, he said. In a suddenly changed tone, he added, To tell you the God's truth, I think you're right. Damn all else they are good for. Why don't you play them as I do to hell with them all? Let us get out of the kip. He stood up gravely, ungirdled, and disrobed himself of his gown, saying resignedly, Mulligan is stripped of his garments. He emptied his pockets onto the table. There's your snot rag, he said. And putting on his stiff collar and rebellious tie, he spoke to them, chiding them, and to his dangling watch chain. His hand plunged and rummaged in his trunk while he called for a clean handkerchief. Agenbite of Inwit. God will simply have to dress the character. I want puce gloves and green boots. Contradiction. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. Mercurial Malachi. A limp black missile flew out of his talking hands. And there's your Latin quarter hat, he said. Stephen picked it up and put it on. Haynes called to them from the doorway. Are you coming, you fellows? I'm ready, Buck Mulligan answered, going towards the door. Come on, Kinch. You have eaten all we left, I suppose, resigned. He passed out with grave words and gait, saying well nigh with sorrow. And going forth, he met Butterfly. Stephen, taking his ash plant from its leaning place, followed them out and as they went down the ladder, pulled to the slow iron door and locked it. He put the huge key in, it, in his inner pocket. At the foot of the ladder, Buck Mulligan asked, Did you bring the key? I have it, Stephen said, preceding them. He walked on. Behind him he heard Buck Mulligan club with his heavy bath towel the leather shoots of ferns or, or grasses. Down, sir. How dare you, sir? Haynes asked. Do you pay rent for this tower? Twelve quid, Buck Mulligan said. To the Secretary of State of war for War, Stephen added over his shoulder. They halted while Haynes surveyed the tower and said at last, Rather bleak in wintertime, I should say. Martello, you call it? Billy Pitt had them built, Buck Mulligan said, when the French were on the sea. But ours is the Omphalus. What is your idea of Hamlet? Haynes asked Stephen. No, no, Buck Mulligan shouted in pain. I'm not equal to Thomas Aquinas, the fif fifty-five reasons he has made to prop it up. Wait till I have a few pints in me first. He turned to Stephen, saying as he pulled down neatly the peaks of his primrose waistcoat. You couldn't manage it under three pints, Kinch, could you? It waited so long, Stephen said listlessly. It, can't wait. it can wait longer. You pique my curiosity, Haynes said amiably. Is it some paradox? Pooh, Buck Mulligan said. We've grown out of wild and paradoxes. It's quite simple. He proves by algebra that Hamlet's grandson is Shakespeare's grandfather and that he himself is the ghost of his own father. What? Haynes said, beginning to point at Stephen. Him. He himself? Buck Mulligan slung his towel stolewise round his neck and bending in loose laughter said to Stephen's ear, Oh, shade of Kinch the elder, Japhet in search of a father. We're always tired in the morning, Stephen said to Haynes, and it is rather long to tell. Buck Mulligan, walking forward again, raised his hands. The sacred pint alone can unbind the tongue of Daedalus, he said. I mean to say, Haynes explained to Stephen as they followed. This tower and these cliffs here remind me somehow of Elsinore. That beetles o'er his base into the sea, isn't it? Buck Mulligan turned suddenly for an instant towards Stephen, but did not speak. In the bright silent instant, Stephen saw his own image in cheap, dusty mourning between their grey attires. It's a wonderful tale, Haynes said, bringing them to halt again.
eyes, pale as the sea, the wind had freshened, paler, firm and prudent. The sea's ruler, he gazed southward over the bay, empty save for the smoke plume of the mail boat, vague on the bright skyline, and a sail tacking by the muglins. I read a theological interpretation of it somewhere, it's, he said, bemused. The father and the son ID, the son striving to be atoned by the father. Buck Mulligan at once put on a blighty, broadly smiling face. He looked at them, his well-shaped mouth open happily, his eyes, from which he had suddenly withdraw all shrewd essence, blinking with mad gaiety. He moved the dolls head to and fro, the brims of his Panama hat quivering, and began to chant in a quiet, happy, foolish voice. I'm the queerest young fellow that ever heard. You heard. <laughs> Come again. I'm the queerest young fellow that ever you heard. My mother's a Jew, my father's a bird. With Joseph, in the, with Joseph the joiner, I cannot agree. So ears to disciplis, disciplis, disciplis. <laughs> You're all <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> so ears to disciplis and Calvary. He held up a forefinger of warning. If anyone thinks that I am divine, he'll get no free drinks when I'm making the wine. But I have to bring what? But I have to bring water and wish it were plain that I make when the. Sh Ooh. That I'm that I make when the wine becomes water again. <laughs> what happened? I got cut. <laughs> He tugged swiftly at Stephen's ash plant in farewell, and, running forward to the brow of the cliff, fluttered his hands at his sides like fins, or wings of one about to rise in the air, and chanted, Goodbye now, goodbye, write down all I said, and tell Tom, Dick, and Harry I rose from the dead, what's bred in the bone cannot fail me to fly, and all of it's breezy, goodbye now, goodbye. He capered before them down towards the forty-foot hole, fluttering his wing-like hands, leaping nimbly, Mercury's hat quivering in the fresh air that bore back to them his brief bird-like cries. Haynes, who had been laughing guardedly, walked on beside Stephen and said, We oughtn't to laugh, I suppose. He's rather blasphemous. I'm not a believer myself, that is to say. Still, his gaiety takes the harm out of it somehow, doesn't it? What did he call it? Joseph the Joiner? The Ballad of Joking Jesus, Stephen, Stephen answered. Oh, Haynes said, you've heard it before. Three times a day after meals, Stephen said dryly. You're not a believer, are you? Haynes asked. I mean, a believer in the narrow sense of the word. Creation from nothing and, and miracles and a personal God. There's only one sense of the word, it seems to me, Stephen said. Haynes, Haynes stopped to take out a smooth silver case in which twinkled a green stone. He sprang it open with his thumb and offered it. Thank you, Stephen said, taking a cigarette. Haynes helped himself and snapped the case too. He put it back in his side pocket and took from his waistcoat pocket a nickel tinderbox. Sprang it open too, and having lit a cigarette, held the flaming spunk towards Stephen in the shell of his hands. Yes, of course, he said, as they went on again. Either you believe or you don't, isn't it? Personally, I couldn't stomach that idea of a personal God. You don't stand for that, I suppose. You behold in me, Stephen said with grim displeasure, a horrible example of free thought. He walked on, waiting to be spoken to, trailing his ash plant by his side. Its feral followed lightly on the path, squealing at his heels. My familiar, after me, calling me Stephen, a wavering line along the path, 
They will walk on it tonight, coming here in the dark. He wants that key. It is mine. I paid the rent. Now I eat his salt bread. Give him the key, too. All. He will ask for it. That was in his eyes. After all, Haynes began. Stephen turned and saw that the cold gaze which had measured him was not all unkind. After all, I should think you were able to free yourself. You are your own master, it seems to me. I am a servant of two masters, Stephen said. An English and an Italian. Italian, Haynes said. A crazy queen, old and jealous. Kneel down before me. And the third, Stephen said. And there is who wants me for odd jobs. Italian? Haynes said again. What do you mean? The Imperial British State, Stephen answered, his color rising, and the Holy Roman Catholic and Apocalyptic Church. Haynes detached from his underlip some fibers of tobacco before he spoke. I can understand that, he said calmly. An Irishman think like that, I dare say. We feel in England that we have treated you fair, rather unfairly. It seems history is to blame. The proud, potent titles clanged over Stephen's memory, the triumph of the brazen bells. A unum sanctum catholicum, a apotolicum escoscum. The slow growth and change of right and dogma like his own rare thoughts. A chemistry of stars. Symbol of the apostles in the, in the mass of, for Pope Marcellus. The voices blended, singing alone, aloud in affirmation. And behind their chant, the vigilant angel of the church, militant, disarmed, and menaced in her hyzerex. A horde of heresies fleeing with mitres awry. Photius with the, and the brood of mockers of whom Mulligan was one. And Arius wearing his life long upon constant ability of the, the son with the father and Valentine. Spurning upon Christ's terrene body and the subtle African hierarch Sabulus, who held that the father was himself his own son. Words Mulligan had spoken a moment since in a mockery to the stranger. Idle mockery. The void awaits surely all them that weave the wind. A menace, a disarming and, wor a, disarming and a worsting from those embattled angels of the church. Michael's host who defends who defend her ever in the honor of conflict with their lances and their shields. Here, here, prolonged applause. Zut! Nom de Dieu! Of course I'm a Britisher, Haynes' voice said, and I feel as one. I don't want to see my country fall onto the, into the hands of German Jews either. That's our national problem, I'm afraid, just now. Two men stood at the verge of the cliff watching. Businessmen. Boatsman. She's making for Bullock Harbor. The boatsman nodded toward the north of the bay with some disdain. There's five fathoms out there, he said. It'll be swept up that way when the tide comes in about one. It's nine days today. The man, was, the man that was drowned, a sail veering about the blank bay waiting for a swollen bundle to bob up, roll over to the, to the sun, a, a puffy face, salt white. Here I am. They followed the winding path down to the creek. Buck Mulligan stood on a stone in shirt sleeves, his unclipped tie rippling over his shoulder. A young man clinging to a spur of rock near, his, near him moved slow, slowly frogwise, his green legs in the deep jelly of the water. Is the brother with you, Malachi? Deep in Westmeath. With the, mat, with the Bannons. Still there? I got a card from Bannon. Says he found a sweet young thing down there. Photo girl, he calls her. Snapshot, eh? Brief exposure. <laughs> Buck Mulligan sat down to unlace his boots. An elderly man shot up near the spur of a rock, a blowing red face. He scrambled up by those stones, water glistening on his plate on its, and on its garland of grey hair, 
water riling over his chest and paunch and spilling jets out of his black sagging loincloth. Buck Mulligan made his way to scramble past and glancing at Haynes and Stephen, crossed himself piously with his thumbnail at, at, at brow and lips and breastbone. Seymour's back in town, the young man said, ga gasping his spur of rock. Chucking medicine, going in for the army. Ah, go to the god, Buck Mulligan said. Going over, going over next week to Stu. You know that Red Carlisle girl, Lily? Yes. No. Maybe. Seymour's back in town, the young... Oh, are you going here, Malachi? Yes, make room in the bed. The young man shoved himself backward through the water and reached the middle of the creek in, the two, long, in two long cream strokes. Hang sat down on a stone smoking. Are you not coming in, Buck Mulligan? Later on, Haines said. Not on my breakfast. Stephen turned away. I'm going, Mulligan, he said. Give us the key, Kinch. Buck Mulligan said, to keep my chemise flat. Stephen handed him the key. Buck Mulligan laid it across his heaped clothes. And two pence, he said, for a pint. Throw it there. Stephen threw two pennies on the soft heap. Dressing, undressing. Buck Mulligan, erect, with joined hands before him, said solemnly, He who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord. Thus spoke Zarthustra. His plump body plunged. We'll see you again, Haynes said. Alan, we need you. Turning as Stephen walked up the path and smiling at wild Irish. Horn of a bull, hoof of a horse, smile of a Saxon. The ship, Buck Mulligan cried. Half twelve. Good, Stephen said. He walked along the upward curving path. Liata Riutilium Turma Circulum Det Jubilatium et Virginum. The priest, grey Nimbus, in a niche where he dressed discreetly. I will not sleep here tonight. Home also, I cannot go. A voice sweetened and sustained. Called, called him from, from the, the sea, sea. Turning the curve, he waved his hand. It, it called again, as the sleek brown head, a seal's far out on the water, round, round usurper. End of part one. Sorry, section one. <laughs> <laughs> This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 2 
"'You, Cochrane, what city sent for him?' "'Tarentum, sir.' "'Very good. Well?' "'There was a battle, sir.' "'Very good. Where?' The boy's blank face asked the blank window. Fabled by the daughters of memory, and yet it was in some way, if not as memory fabled it. A phrase, then, of impatience, thud of Blake's wings of excess. I hear the ruin of all space, shattered glass and toppling masonry, and time one livid final flame. What's left us, then? I forget the place, sir. 279 B.C. Asculum, Stephen said, glancing at the name and date in the Gorse Guard book. Yes, sir. And he said, Another victory like that, and we are done for. That phrase the world had remembered. A dull ease of the mind. From a hill above a corpse-strewn plain, a general speaking to his officers leaned upon his spear. Any general, to any officers. They lend ear. "'You, Armstrong,' Stephen said. "'What was the end of Pyrrhus?' "'End of Pyrrhus, sir?' "'I know, sir. Ask me, sir,' Coman said. "'Wait. You, Armstrong, do you know anything about Pyrrhus?' A bag of fig-rolls lay snugly in Armstrong's satchel. He curled them between his palms at whiles, and swallowed them softly. Crumbs adhered to the tissue of his lips— a sweetened boy's breath, well-off people, proud that their eldest son was in the navy. Vico Road, Dalkey. Pyrrhus, sir? Pyrrhus, a peer. All laughed. Mirthless, high, malicious laughter. Armstrong looked round at his classmates, silly glee in profile. In a moment they will laugh more loudly, aware of my lack of rule, and of the fees their papas pay. "'Tell me now,' Stephen said, poking the boy's shoulder with the book, "'what is a peer?' "'A peer, sir,' Armstrong said. "'A thing out in the water, a kind of a bridge. Kingstown Pier, sir.' Some laughed again, mirthless but with meaning. Two in the back bench whispered, "'Yes, they knew.' had never learned nor ever been innocent. All. With envy he watched their faces, Edith, Ethel, Gertie, Lily, their likes, their breaths too sweetened with tea and jam, their bracelets tittering in the struggle. "'Kingstown Pier,' Stephen said. "'Yes, a disappointed bridge.' The words troubled their gaze. "'How, sir?' Coman asked. A bridge is across a river. For Haynes' chapbook, no one here to hear, tonight deftly amid wild drink and talk, to pierce the polished mail of his mind, what then? A jester at the court of his master, indulge and disesteemed, winning a clement master's praise. Why had they chosen all that part, not wholly for the smooth caress? For them, too, history was a tale like any other too often heard, their land a pawn-shop. Had Pyrrhus not fallen by a bedlam's hand in Argos, or Julius Caesar not been knifed to death? They are not to be thought away. Time has branded them, and fettered they are lodged in the room of the infinite possibilities they have ousted. But can those have been possible, seeing that they never were? Or was that only possible which came to pass? Weave, weaver of the wind. Tell us a story, sir. Oh, do, sir, a ghost story. Where do you begin in this? Stephen asked, opening another book. Weep no more, Coman said. Go on, then, Talbot. And the story, sir? After, Stephen said. Go on, Talbot. A swarthy boy opened a book and propped it nimbly under the breastwork of his satchel. He recited jerks of verse with odd glances at the text. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more, for Lycidas, your sorrow, is not dead, sunk though he be beneath the watery floor. 
It must be a movement, then, an actuality of the possible as possible. Aristotle's phrase formed itself within the gabbled verses, and floated out into the studious silence of the library of St. Genevieve, where he had read, sheltered from the sin of Paris, night by night. By his elbow a delicate Siamese conned a handbook of strategy. Fed and feeding brains about me, under glow-lamps, impaled, with faintly beating feelers, and in my mind's darkness a sloth of the underworld, reluctant, shy of brightness, shifting her dragon scaly folds. Thought is the thought of thought, tranquil brightness. The soul is in a manner all that is, the soul is the form of forms. Tranquillity sudden, vast, candescent, form of forms. Talbot repeated. Through the dear might of him that walked the waves, through the dear might. Turn over, Stephen said quietly. I don't see anything. What, sir? Talbot asked simply, bending forward. His hand turned the page over. He leaned back and went on again, having just remembered. Of him that walked the waves. Here also over these craven hearts his shadow lies, and on the scoffer's heart and lips and on mine. It lies upon their eager faces who offered him a coin of the tribute. To Caesar what is Caesar's, to God what is God's. A long look from dark eyes, a riddling sentence to be woven and woven on the church's looms. Aye. Riddle me, riddle me, Randy Rowe, my father gave me seeds to sow. Talbot slid his closed book into his satchel. "'Have I heard all?' Stephen asked. "'Yes, sir. Hockey at ten, sir. Half day, sir, Thursday.' "'Who can answer a riddle?' Stephen asked. They bundled their books away, pencils clacking, pages rustling. Crowding together, they strapped and buckled their satchels, all gabbling gaily. "'A riddle, sir. Ask me, sir.' Oh, ask me, sir. A hard one, sir. This is the riddle, Stephen said. The cock crew, the sky was blue, the bells in heaven were striking eleven. Tis time for this poor soul to go to heaven. What is that? What, sir? Again, sir, we didn't hear. Their eyes grew bigger as the lines were repeated. After a silence, Cochrane said, "'What is it, sir? We give it up.' Stephen, his throat itching, answered, "'The fox burying his grandmother under a holly-bush.' He stood up and gave a shout of nervous laughter, to which their cries echoed dismay. A stick struck the door, and a voice in the corridor called, "'Hockey!' They broke asunder, sidling out of their benches, leaping them. Quickly they were gone, and from the lumber-room came the rattle of sticks and clamour of their boots and tongues. Sergeant, who alone had lingered, came forward slowly, showing an open copy-book. His thick hair and scraggy neck gave witness of unreadiness, and through his misty glasses weak eyes looked up, pleading. On his cheek, dull and bloodless, a soft stain of ink lay, date-shaped, recent, and damp as a snail's bed. He held out his copy-book. The word SUMS was written on the headline. Beneath were sloping figures, and at the foot a crooked signature with blind loops and a blot. Cyril Sargent. His name and seal. "'Mr. Deasy told me to write them out all again,' he said, "'and show them to you, sir.' Stephen touched the edges of the book. Futility. "'Do you understand how to do them now?' he asked. "'Numbers eleven to fifteen, Sergeant answered. "'Mr. Deasy said I was to copy them off the board, sir.' "'Can you do them yourself?' Stephen asked. "'No, sir.' Ugly and futile, lean neck and thick hair, and a stain of ink, a snail's bed. Yet some one had loved him, borne him in her arms and in her heart, but for her the race of the world would have trampled him under foot, 
a squashed, boneless snail. She had loved his weak watery blood drained from her own. Was that then real? The only true thing in life? His mother's prostrate body the fiery Columbanus in holy zeal bestrode. She was no more, the trembling skeleton of a twig burnt in the fire, an odour of rosewood and wetted ashes. She had saved him from being trampled under foot, and had gone, scarcely having been. A poor soul gone to heaven, and on a heath beneath winking stars a fox, red reek of rapine in his fur, with merciless bright eyes, scraped in the earth, listened, scraped up the earth, listened, scraped and scraped. Sitting at his side, Stephen solved out the problem. He proves by algebra that Shakespeare's ghost is Hamlet's grandfather. Sergeant peered askance through his slanted glasses. Hockey sticks rattled in the lumber room, the hollow knock of a ball and calls from the field. Across the page the symbols moved in grave Morris, in the mummery of their letters, wearing quaint caps of squares and cubes. Give hands, traverse, bow to partner. So, imps of fancy of the Moors. Gone too from the world, Averroes and Moses Maimonides, dark men in mien and movement, flashing in their mocking mirrors the obscure soul of the world, a darkness shining in brightness which brightness could not comprehend. Do you understand now? Can you work the second for yourself? Yes, sir. In long shaky strokes, Sergeant copied the data. Waiting always for a word of help, his hand moved faithfully the unsteady symbols, a faint hue of shame flickering behind his dull skin. Amor matris, subjective and objective genitive. With her weak blood and whey-sour milk she had fed him, and hid from sight of others his swaddling bands. Like him I was, these sloping shoulders, this gracelessness. My childhood bends beside me. Too far for me to lay a hand there once or lightly. Mine is far, and his secret as our eyes. Secrets, silent, stony, sit in the dark palaces of both our hearts. Secrets weary of their tyranny. Tyrants, willing to be dethroned. The sum was done. It is very simple— Stephen said as he stood up. "'Yes, sir, thanks,' Sergeant answered. He dried the page with a sheet of thin blotting paper, and carried his copy-book back to his bench. "'You had better get your stick and go out to the others,' Stephen said as he followed towards the door the boy's graceless form. "'Yes, sir.' In the corridor his name was heard, called from the playfield. "'Sergeant!' "'Run on,' Stephen said. "'Mr. Deasy is calling you.' He stood in the porch and watched the laggard hurry towards the scrappy field where sharp voices were in strife. They were sorted in teams, and Mr. Deasy came away stepping over wisps of grass with gaitered feet. When he had reached the schoolhouse, voices again contending called to him. He turned his angry white moustache. "'What is it now?' he cried continually, without listening." "'Cochrane and Halliday are on the same side, sir,' Stephen said. "'Will you wait in my study for a moment,' Mr. Deasy said, "'till I restore order here.' And as he stepped fussily back across the field, his old man's voice cried sternly, "'What is the matter? What is it now?' Their sharp voices cried about him on all sides. Their many forms closed round him the garish sunshine bleaching the honey of his ill-dyed head. Stale, smoky air hung in the study with the smell of drab, abraded leather of its chairs. As on the first day he bargained with me here. As it was in the beginning, is now. On the sideboard the tray of Stuart coins, base treasure of a bog, and never shall be. And snug in their spoon-case of purple plush, faded, the twelve apostles having preached to all the Gentiles, world without end. A hasty step over the stone porch and in the corridor. 
Blowing out his rare moustache, Mr. Deasy halted at the table. First, our little financial settlement,' he said. He brought out of his coat a pocket-book bound by a leather thong. It slapped open, and he took from it two notes, one of joined halves, and laid them carefully on the table. Two, he said, strapping and stowing his pocket-book away. And now his strong-room for the gold. Stephen's embarrassed hand moved over the shells heaped in the stone, heaped in the cold stone mortar, whelks and money-cowries and leopard-shells, and this whirled as an emir's turban, and this the scallop of St. James. An old pilgrim's hoard, dead treasure, hollow shells. A sovereign fell, bright and new, on the soft pile of the tablecloth. Three, Mr. Deasy said, turning his little savings box about in his hand. These are handy things to have, see? This is for sovereigns, this is for shillings, sixpences, half-crowns, and here crowns, see? He shot from it two crowns and two shillings. Three twelve, he said. I think you'll find that's right. Thank you, sir, Stephen said, gathering the money together with shy haste and putting it all in a pocket of his trousers. "'No thanks at all,' Mr. Deasy said. "'You have earned it.' Stephen's hand, free again, went back to the hollow shells. Symbols, too, of beauty and of power. A lump in my pocket. Symbols soiled by greed and misery. "'Don't carry it like that,' Mr. Deasy said. "'You'll pull it out somewhere and lose it. You just buy one of these machines. You'll find them very handy.' "'Answer something.' "'Mine would be often empty,' Stephen said. "'The same room and hour, the same wisdom, and I the same. Three times now. Three nooses round me here. Well, I can break them in this instant if I will.' "'Because you don't save,' Mr. Deasy said, pointing his finger. "'You don't know yet what money is. Money is power. When you have lived as long as I have, I know, I know, if youth but knew—' What does Shakespeare say? Put but money in thy purse. Iago, Stephen murmured. He lifted his gaze from the idle shells to the old man's stare. He knew what money was, Mr. Deasy said. He made money. A poet, yes, but an Englishman, too. Do you know what is the pride of the English? Do you know what is the proudest word you will ever hear from an Englishman's mouth? The sea's ruler. His sea-cold eyes looked on the empty bay. It seems history is to blame, on me and on my words unhating. That on his empire, Stephen said, the sun never sets. Bah! Mr. Deasy cried. That's not English. A French Celt said that. He tapped his savings box against his thumbnail. I will tell you, he said solemnly, what is his proudest boast. I paid my way. Good man, good man. I paid my way. I never borrowed a shilling in my life. Can you feel that? I owe nothing. Can you? Mulligan, nine pounds, three pairs of socks, one pair brogues, ties. Curran, ten guineas. McCann, one guinea. Fred Ryan, two shillings. Temple, two lunches. Russell, one guinea. Cousins, ten shillings. Bob Reynolds, half a guinea, Curler, three guineas, Mrs. McKernan, five weeks' board. The lump I have is useless. For the moment, no, Stephen answered. Mr. Deasy laughed with rich delight, putting back his savings-box. I knew you couldn't, he said joyously, but one day you must feel it. We are a generous people, but we must also be just. I fear those big words, Stephen said, which make us so unhappy. Mr. Deasy stared sternly for some moments over the mantelpiece at the shapely bulk of a man in tartan filibegs, Prince Albert. Albert Edward, Prince of Wales. 
"'You think me an old fogey and an old Tory,' his thoughtful voice said. "'I saw three generations since O'Connell's time. "'I remember the famine in forty-six. "'Do you know that the Orange Lodges agitated for a repeal of the Union twenty years before O'Connell did, "'or before the prelates of your communion denounced him as a demagogue? "'You Fenians forget some things.' glorious, pious, and immortal memory, the lodge of diamond in Armagh, the splendid behung with corpses of papishes, horse, masked and armed, the planter's covenant, the black north and true blue Bible, croppies lie down. Stephen sketched a brief gesture. I have rebel blood in me too, Mr. Deasy said, on the spindle side, but I am descended from Sir John Blackwood, who voted for the Union. We are all Irish, all King's sons. Alas, Stephen said. Per vias rectus, Mr. Deasy said firmly, was his motto. He voted for it, and put on his top boots to ride to Dublin from the Ards of Down to do so. Lal the ral the ra, the rocky road to Dublin. A gruff squire on horseback with shiny top boots. Soft day, Sir John. Soft day, Your Honour. Day, day. Two top boots jog dangling on to Dublin. Lal the ral the ra. Lal the ral the raddy. That reminds me, Mr. Deasy said. You can do me a favour, Mr. Dedalus, with some of your literary friends. I have a letter here for the press. Sit down a moment. I have just to copy the end. He went to the desk near the window, pulled in his chair twice, and read off some words from the sheet on the drum of his typewriter. "'Sit down. Excuse me,' he said over his shoulder. "'The dictates of common sense. Just a moment.' He peered from under his shaggy brows at the manuscript by his elbow, and, muttering, began to prod the stiff buttons of the keyboard slowly, sometimes blowing as he screwed up the drum to erase an error. Stephen seated himself noiselessly before the princely presence. Framed around the walls, images of vanished horses stood in homage, their meek heads poised in air. Lord Hastings' repulse, the Duke of Westminster's shot over, the Duke of Beaufort's Ceylon, Prix de Paris, 1866. Elfin riders sat them, watchful of a sign. He saw their speeds, backing King's colours, and shouted with the shouts of vanished crowds. "'Full stop,' Mr. Deasy bade his keys. But prompt ventilation of this all-important question. Where Cranley led me to get rich quick, hunting his winners among the mud-splashed brakes, amid the balls of bookies on their pitches and reek of the canteen, over the motley slush. Fair rebel, fair rebel, even money the favourite, ten to one the field— Dicers and thimble-riggers we hurried by after the hooves, the vying caps and jackets, and past the meat-faced woman, a butcher's dame, nuzzling thirstily her clove of orange. Shouts rang shrill from the boys' playfield, and a whirring whistle. Again, a goal. I am among them, among their battling bodies, in a medley, the joust of life. You mean that knock-kneed mother's darling who seems to be slightly crossick? Jousts. Time shocked rebounds, shock by shock. Jousts, slush and uproar of battles, the frozen death-spew of the slain, a shout of spear-spikes baited with men's bloodied guts. Now then, Mr. Deasy said, rising. He came to the table, pinning together his sheets. Stephen stood up. I have put the matter into a nutshell, Mr. Deasy said. It's about the foot and mouth disease. Just look through it. There can be no two opinions on the matter. May I trespass on your valuable space, that doctrine of laissez-faire which so often in our history, the cattle trade, the way of all our old industries, Liverpool ring which jockeyed the Galway harbour scheme, European conflagration, Grain supplies through the narrow waters of the channel, the pluter-perfect imperturb imperturbability of the Department of Agriculture, pardoned a classical allusion, Cassandra, 
by a woman who was no better than she should be, to come to the point at issue. "'I don't mince words, do I?' Mr. Deasy asked, as Stephen read on. "'Foot and mouth disease, known as Cox preparation, serum and virus, percentage of salted horses, rinderpest, emperor's horses at Mertzteg, lower Austria, veterinary surgeons, Mr. Henry Blackwood Price, courteous offer a fair trial, dictates of common sense, all-important question, in every sense of the word take the bull by the horns, thanking you for the hospitality of your columns. I want that to be printed and read, Mr. Deasy said. You will see at the next outbreak they will put an embargo on Irish cattle, and it can be cured, it is cured. My cousin, Blackwood Price, writes to me it is regularly treated and cured in Austria by cattle doctors there. They offer to come over here. I am trying to work up influence with the department. Now I am going to try publicity. I am surrounded by difficulties, by intrigues, by backstairs influence, by— He raised his forefinger and beat the air oddly before his voice spoke. "'Mark my words, Mr. Dedalus,' he said. "'England is in the hands of the Jews, in all the highest places, her finance, her press, and they are the signs of a nation's decay. Wherever they gather they eat up the nation's vital strength. I have seen it coming these years. As sure as we are standing here the Jew merchants are already at their work of destruction. Old England is dying.' He stepped swiftly off his eyes coming to blue life as they passed a broad sunbeam. He faced about and back again. Dying, he said again, if not dead by now. The harlot's cry from street to street shall weave old England's winding sheet. His eyes, open wide in vision, stared sternly across the sunbeam which he halted, in which he halted. A merchant, Stephen said, is one who buys cheap and sells dear, Jew or Gentile, is he not? They sinned against the light, Mr. Deasy said gravely, and you can see the darkness in their eyes, and that is why they are wanderers on the earth to this day. On the steps of the Paris Stock Exchange, the gold-skinned men quoting prices on their gemmed fingers, gabble of geese, they swarmed loud, uncouth about the temple, their heads thick plotting under maladroit silk hats. Not theirs, these clothes, this speech, these gestures. Their full, slow eyes belied the words, their gestures eager and unoffending, but knew the rancors massed about them, and knew their zeal was in vain. Vain patience to heap and hoard. Time surely would scatter all a hoard heaped by the roadside, plundered and passing on. Their eyes knew their years of wandering, and, patient, knew the dishonours of their flesh. "'Who has not?' Stephen said. "'What do you mean?' Mr. Deasy asked. He came forward a pace and stood by the table. His under jaw fell sideways, open uncertainly. "'Is this old wisdom? He waits to hear from me.' History, Stephen said, is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. From the playfield the boys raised a shout, a whirring whistle. Goal! What if that nightmare gave you a back kick? The ways of the Creator are not our ways, Mr. Deasy said. All human history moves towards one great goal, the manifestation of God. Stephen jerked his thumb towards the window, saying, "'That is God.' "'Hooray! I Hooray!' "'What?' Mr. Deasy asked. "'A shout in the street,' Stephen answered, shrugging his shoulders. Mr. Deasy looked down, and held for a while the wings of his nose tweaked between his fingers. Looking up again, he set them free. "'I am happier than you are,' he said. We have committed many errors and many sins. A woman brought sin into the world, for a woman who was no better than she should be, Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus. Ten years the Greeks made war on Troy. 
A faithless wife first brought the strangers to our shore here. MacMurrow's wife and her layman, O'Rourke, Prince of Brefni. A woman, too, brought Parnell low. Many errors, many failures, but not the one sin. I am a struggler now at the end of my days, but I will fight for the right till the end. For Ulster will fight, and Ulster will be right. Stephen raised the sheets in his hand. "'Well, sir,' he began. "'I foresee,' Mr. Deasy said, "'that you will not remain here very long at this work. "'You were not born to be a teacher, I think. "'Perhaps I am wrong.' "'A learner, rather,' Stephen said. "'And here what will you learn more?' Mr. Deasy shook his head. "'Who knows,' he said. "'To learn one must be humble. "'But life is the great teacher.' Stephen rustled the sheets again. "'As regards these,' he began. "'Yes,' Mr. Deasy said. "'You have two copies there, if you can have them published at once.' "'Telegraph. Irish Homestead. "'I will try,' Stephen said, "'and let you know to-morrow. I know two editors slightly.' "'That will do,' Mr. Deasy said briskly. "'I wrote last night to Mr. Field, M.P.' There is a meeting of the Cattle Traders Association to-day at the City Arms Hotel. I asked him to lay my letter before the meeting. You see if you can get it into your two papers. What are they? The Evening Telegraph. That will do, Mr. Deasy said. There is no time to lose. Now I have to answer that letter from my cousin. Good morning, sir, Stephen said, putting the sheets in his pocket. Thank you. "'Not at all,' Mr. Deasy said, as he searched the papers on his desk. "'I like to break a lance with you, old as I am.' "'Good morning, sir,' Stephen said again, bowing to his bent back. He went out by the open porch and down the gravel path under the trees, hearing the cries of voices and crack of sticks from the playfield. The lions couchant on the pillars as he passed out through the gate— toothless terrors. Still, I will help him in his fight. Mulligan will dub me a new name, the Bullock-befriending Bard. Mr. Dedalus! Running after me. No more letters, I hope. Just one moment. Yes, sir, Stephen said, turning back at the gate. Mr. Deasy halted, breathing hard and swallowing his breath. "'I just wanted to say,' he said, "'Ireland, they say, has the honour of being the only country which never persecuted the Jews. Do you know that? No. And do you know why?' He frowned sternly on the bright air. "'Why, sir?' Stephen asked, beginning to smile. "'Because she never let them in,' Mr. Deasy said solemnly. A cough-ball of laughter leaped from his throat, dragging after it a rattling chain of phlegm. He turned back quickly, coughing, laughing, his lifted arms waving to the air. "'She never let them in!' he cried again through his laughter, as he stamped on gaitered feet over the gravel of the path. "'That's why!' On his wise shoulders, through the checkerwork of leaves, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins, End of chapter 2. Read by Kara Schallenberg on March 3rd, 2006, in Oceanside, California, and left completely unedited at Hugh's request. Hope you enjoyed it. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Today's reading by Miette and Philip. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 3. Ineluctable modality of the visible. At least that, if no more, thought through my eyes. 
signatures of all things I am here to read. Sea spawn and sea rack, the nearing tide, that rusty boot. Snot green, blue silver rust, coloured signs. Limits of the diaphan. But, he adds, in bodies. Then he was aware of them bodies before of them coloured. How? By knocking his sconce against them, sure. Go easy. Bold he was and a millionaire, maestro di cola che sano. Limit of the diaphan in. Why in? Diaphan, adiaphan. If you can put your five fingers through it, it is a gate, if not a door. Shut your eyes and see. Stephen closed his eyes to hear his boots crush crackling rack and shells. You are walking through it howsomever. I am a stride at a time. A very short space of time through very short times of space. Five, six. The... Nakyananda. Exactly. And that is the ineluctable modality of the audible. Open your eyes. No, Jesus! If I fell over a cliff, that beetle's or his base fell through the... Nebinyanda. Ineluctably. I am getting on nicely in the dark. My ash sword hangs at my side. Tap with it, they do. My two feet in his boots are at the ends of his legs. Nebeneande. Sounds solid. Made by the mallet of Los Demiurgos. Am I walking into eternity along Sandy Mount Strand? Crush, crack, crick, crick, wild sea money. Domini Dizi Kenzeme. Won't you come to Sandy Mount, Madeline the Ma? Rhythm begins, you see. I hear a cataleptic tetrameter of iams marching. No, a gallop. Deline the ma. Open your eyes now, I will. One moment. Has all vanished since. If I open and am forever in the black adiaphan, basta. I will see if I can see. See now. There all the time without you and ever shall be world without end. They came down the steps from Leahy's terrace prudently, Frau and Zimmer, and down the shelving shore flabbily, their splayed feet sinking in the silted sand. Like me, like Algy, coming down to our mighty mother, number one swung lordily her midwife's bag, the others gump picked in the beach. From the liberties, out for the day. Mrs. Florence McCabe, relict of the late Patrick McCabe, deeply lamented of Bride Street. One of her sisterhood lugged me squealing into life, creation from nothing. What has she in the bag? A Miss Birth with a trailing navel cord, hushed in ruddy wool. The cords of all link back, strand entwining cable of all flesh. That is why mystic monks, will you be as gods? Gaze in your omphalos. Hello, Kinch here. Put me on to Edenville, Aleph, Alpha, Not, Not, One. Spouse and helpmate of Adam Cademan, Eva, naked Eve. She had no navel. Gaze. Belly without blemish, bulging big, a buckler of taut vellum. No, white heaped corn, orient and immortal, standing from everlasting to everlasting. Womb of sin. Wombed in sin darkness I was too, made not begotten. By them the man with my voice in my eyes, and a ghost woman with ashes on her breath. They clasped and sundered, did the couple's, coupler's will. From before the ages he willed me, and now may not will me away or ever. Alex Eterna stays about him. Is that then the divine substance wherein father and son are consubstantial? Where is poor dear Arius to try conclusions, warring his life long upon the contransmagnificand jubantantiality? Ill starred, here see Ark in a Greek water closet, he breathed his laugh, euthanasia. With a beaded mitre and a crozier, stalled upon his throne, widower of a widowed sea, with upstiffed omorphorian, with clotted hinderpants. Hairs romped round him, nicking his eager airs. They're coming waves. 
White maned sea horses chomping, bright wind bridled the steeds of Manan. I mustn't forget his letter for the press. And after the ship, half twelve. By the way, go easy with that money like a good young imbecile. Yes, I must. His pace slackened. Here. Am I going to Aunt Sarah's or not? My consubstantial father's voice. Did you see anything of your artist brother Stephen lately? No? Sure, he's not down in Strasbourg Terrace with his Aunt Sally. Couldn't he fly a bit higher than that, eh? And, 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 and tell us, Stephen, how is Uncle C? Oh, weeping God, the things I married into. To boys up in the hayloft, the drunken little cost drawer and his brother, the cornet player. Highly respectable gondoliers. And ski weird Walter serving his father, no less. Sir, yes, sir, no, sir. Jesus wept, and no wonder by Christ. I pull the wheezy bell of their shuttered cottage, and wait. They take me for a dun, peer out from a coin of vantage. It's Stephen, sir. Let him in, let Stephen in. A bolt drawn back, and Walter welcomes me. We thought you were someone else. In his broad bed, Uncle Richie, pillowed and blanketed, extends over the hillock of his knees a sturdy forearm, clean-chested. He has washed the upper moiety. Morrow, nephew. He lays against the lapboard, whereon he drops his bills of costs for the eyes of Master Guff and Master Shapland Tandy, filling consents and common searches and a writ of deuces teacum. A burgook frame over his bald head. Wild wreck was got. The drone of his misleading whistle brings Walter back. Yes, sir. Malt for Richie and Stephen. Tell mother, where is she? Bathing Chrissy, sir. Papa's little bed pal, lump of love. No, Uncle Richie. Call me Richie. Damn your lithia water. It lowers. Whusky. Uncle Richie, really? Sit down or by the law, Harry, I'll knock you down. Walter squints vainly for a chair. He has nothing to sit down upon, sir. He has nowhere to put it, you mug. Bring our Chippendale chair. Would you like a bite of something? None of your damned lordy doll airs here. The rich of a rush of fried with a herring? Sure? So much the better. We have nothing in the house but backache peels. Pills. A letter. He drones bars at Fernando's aria de sortita, the grandest number, Stephen, in the whole opera. Listen. His tuneful whistle sounds again, finely shaded with rushes of the air, his fists big drumming on his padded knees. This wind is sweeter. Houses of decay, mine, his, and all. You told the Clongo's gentry you had an uncle, a judge and an uncle, a general in the army. Come out of them, Stephen. Beauty is not there, nor in the stagnant bay of Marsh's library where you read the fading prophecies of Joachim Abbas. For whom? The hundred-headed rabble of the cathedral close. A hater of his kind ran from them to the wood of madness, his mane foaming in the moon, his eyeballs stars. Hoyam, horse-nostrilled, the oval equine faces. Temple, Buck Mulligan, Foxy Campbell, Lantern Jaws, Abbas Father, Furious Dean, what offense laid fire to their brains? Puff, Descende Calve ut ne amplius de Calveris. Garland of gray hair on his culminated head. See him, me, clamoring down to the footpace. Descende, clutching a monstrance. Basilisk guide, get down, bald pole. Choir gives back menace and echo, assisting about the altar's horns, the snorted Latin of jack priests moving burly in their albs, tonsured and oiled and gelded, fat with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And at the same instant, perhaps a priest round the corner is elevating it. 
Dring, dring. And two streets off another looking at into a pix. Dring, a dring. And in a lady chapel another taking household all to his own cheek. Dring, dring. Down, up, forward, back. Dan Oakham thought of that invincible doctor. A misty English morning, the imp hypostasis tickled his brain, bringing his host down and kneeling his... He heard twine with his second bell, the first bell in the transept. He is lifting this, and rising, heard... Now I am lifting, there two bells, he is kneeling, twang and diphthong. Cousin Stephen, you will never be a saint. Isle of Saints, you were awfully holy, weren't you? You prayed to the Blessed Virgin that you might not have a red nose. You prayed to the Devil in Serpentine Avenue that the fubsy window in front might lift her clothes still more from the wet street. Oh, see, si, Seto, sell your soul for that, do. Dyed rags pinned round a squall. More, tell me more, more still. On the top of the house, tram alone crying to the rain. Naked women, naked women, what about that, eh? What about what? What else were they invented for? Reading two pages apiece of seven books every night, eh? I was young. You bowed to yourself in the mirror, stepping forward to applause, earnestly, striking face. Ray for the goddamned idiot, Ray. No one saw, tell no one, books you were going to write with letters for titles. Have you read his F? Oh, yes, but I prefer Q. Oh, yes, but Q, uh, W is wonderful. Oh, yes, W. Remember your epiphanies written on green oval leaves? Deeply deep. Copies to be sent if you die to all the great libraries of the world, including Alexandria. Someone was to read them there after a few thousand years of Maha Mavantara, Pico della Mirandola, like I very like a whale. When one reads these strange pages of one long gone, one feels that one is at one with one who wants. The grainy sand had gone from under his feet. His boots trod again a damp, crackling mast, razor shells, squeaking pebbles, that on the unnumbered pebbles beats, wood sieved by the ship warm, lost armada. Unwholesome sand flats waited to suck his treading soles, breathing upward sewage breath. A pocket of seaweed smoldered in sea fire under a midden of man's ashes. He coasted them, walking warily. A porter bottle stood up, stog to its waist, in the cakey sand dough, a sentinel, isle of dreadful thirst. Broken hoops on the shore, at the land, a maze of dark cunning nets. Farther away, chalk scrawled back doors, and on the higher beach, a drying line with two crucified shirts, rings end, wigwams of brown steersmen and master mariners, human shells. He halted. I've passed the way to Aunt Sarah's. Am I not going there? Seems not. No one about. He turned northeast and crossed the firmer sands toward the pigeon house. Qui vous a mis dans cette fichue position? C'est le pigeon, Joseph. Patrice, home on furlough, lapped warm milk with me in the bar McMahon, son of the wild goose Kevin Egan of Paris. My father's a bird. He lapped the sweet lace show with pink young tongue, plump bunny's face. Lap, lapin. He hopes to win the gros lot. About the nature of women he read in Michelet. But he must send me La Vie de Jesus by M. Lille Taxil. Lent it to his friend. C'est donc, vous savez? Moi, je suis socialiste. Je ne crois pas en l'existence de Dieu. Faut pas le dire à mon père. Il croit? What is, mon... How do you say that? Quoi? Il croit? Mon père, oui. Schluss. He laughs. My Latin quarter hat. God, we simply must dress the character. I want puce gloves. You were a student, weren't you? Of what in the other devil's name? 
Persian. P C A N, you know? Physique, chemique, and naturel. Aha. Eating your goat's worth of mu en cive, flesh pots of Egypt, elbowed by belching cabmen. Just say in the most natural tone, when I was in Paris, boule miche, I used to, yes, used to carry punched tickets to prove an alibi if they arrested you for murder somewhere. Justice. On the night of the 17th of February, 1904, the prisoner was seen by two witnesses. One fellow did it. Other, me. Hat, tie, overcoat, nose. Louis, c'est moi. You seem to have enjoyed yourself. Proudly walking. Whom were you trying to walk like? Forget. A dispossessed. With mother's money order, eight shillings, the banging door of the post office slammed in your face by the usher. Hunger toothache. Encore du minutes. Look, clock. Must get fair mate. Hire dog. Shoot him to bloody bits with a bang shotgun. Bits, man. Spattered walls, all brass buttons. Bits all crack in place. Clack back. Not hurt? Oh, that's all right. Shake hands. See what I mean? See? Oh, that's all right. Shake a shake. Oh, that's all only all right. You were going to do wonders. What? Missionary to Europe after fiery Columbanus. Fiacre and Scotus on their creepy stools in heaven split from their pint pots. Loud Latin laughing. UG, UG. Pretending to speak broken English as you dragged your valise. Porch of three pence across the slimy pier at New Haven. Coma? Rich booty you brought back. Le tutu. Five tattered numbers of pantalon blanc. A culotte rouge. A blue French telegram. Curiosity to show. Mother dying. Come home, father. The aunt thinks you killed your mother. That's why she won't. Then here's a health to Mulligan's aunt, and I'll tell you the reason why. She always kept things decent in the Hannigan family. His feet marched in sudden proud rhythm over the sand furrows, along by the boulders of the south wall. He stared at them proudly, piled stone mammoth skulls, gold light on sea, on sand, on boulders. The sun is there, the slender trees, the lemon houses. Paris, rawly walking, crude sunlight on her lemon streets. Moist pith of farrels of braid, the frog green wormwood, her matin incense caught the air. Beluomo rises from the bed of his wife's lover's wife, the kerchiefed housewife's astir, a saucer of ascetic acid in her hand. In Rodos Yvonne and Madeleine, new make their tumbled beauties, shattering with gold teeth, chaussons of pastry, their mouths yellowed with the puce of flambreton. Faces of Paris men go by, their well-pleased pleasures, curled conquistadores. Noon slumbers. Kevin Egan rolls gunpowder cigarettes through fingers smeared with printer's ink, sipping his green fairy as Patrice is white. About us gobblers fork spiced beans down their gullets. On demi A jet of coffee steam from the burnished cauldron. She serves me at his beck. Il est irlandais? Hollandais? Non, fromage. Deux irlandais, nu, Irland. Vous avez? Ah, oui. She thought you wanted a cheese. Hollandais. You're postprandial. Do you know that word? Postprandial. There was a fellow I once knew in Barcelona, a queer fellow, used to call it his postprandial. Well, you do it. Slaint. Around the slab tables, the tangle of wind breaths and grumbling gorges. His breath hangs over a saucer-stained plate, the green fairy's fang thrusting between his lips. Of Ireland, the Dalcassians, of hopes, conspiracies, of Arthur Griffith now, A.E. Pimander, good shepherd of men, to yoke me as his yoke fellow, our crimes, our common cause. 
You're your father's son. I know the voice. His fustian shirt, sanguine flower, trembles its Spanish tassels at his secrets. M. Drummond, famous journalist, Drummond. I know what he called Queen Victoria. Old hag with yellow teeth. Vile ogressa with don't jones. Maud Gaum, beautiful woman. La Patrie. Mademoiselle Milio. Felix Ford, you know how he died? Licentious men. The Froken. Bon à tout fair. Who rubs male nakedness in the bath at Uppsala. Moi fair, she said. Tous les messieurs. Not this, monsieur, I said. Most licentious custom. Bath, a most private thing. I wouldn't let my brother, not even my own brother. Most lascivious thing. Green eyes, I see you. Fang, I feel. Lascivious people. The blue fuse burns deadly between hands and burns clear. Loose tobacco shreds catch fire. A flame and acrid smoke light our corner. Raw face bones under his peep of dear boy's hut. How the head centre got away. Authentic version. Got up as a young bride. Man. Veil orange blossoms. Drove up the road to Malahide. Did. Fit. Of lost leaders the betrayed. Wild escapes. Disguises clutched at. Gone. Not here. Spurned lover. I was a strapping young gossin at that time, I tell you. I'll show you my likeness one day. I was. Fifth. Lover. For her love he prowled with Colonel Richard Burke, tainous of his sept, under the walls of Clerkenwell, and, crouching, saw a flame of vengeance hurl them upward in the fog. Shattered glass and toppling masonry. In gay Paris he hides, eager of Paris, unsought by any save by me. Making his day's stations, the dingy printing case, his three taverns, the Montmartre lair he sleeps short night in, rue de la Goutte d'Or, damascened with fly-bound faces of the gone. Loveless, landless, wifeless. She is quite nicely cooked thee without her outcast man, madame in Rue Guit le Cour, canary and two book lodges. Peachy cheeks, a zebra skirt, frisky as a young thing's, spurned and undespairing. Tell Pat you saw me, won't you? I wanted to get poor Pat a job one time. Mon fils, soldier of France. I taught him to sing the boys of Kilkenny our stout roaring blades. No, that old lay. I taught Patrice that. Old Kilkenny, St. Canis, Strongbow's castle on the Nore, goes like this. Oh, oh, he takes me Napatandi by the hand. Oh, oh, the boys of Kilkenny. Weak wasting hand on mine. They have forgotten Kevin Egan, not he them. Remembering thee, O oh, Sion. He had come near the edge of the sea, and wet sand slapped his boots. The new air greeted him, harping in wild nerves, wind of wild air and seeds brightness. Here, I am not walking out to the Kish lightship, am I? He stood suddenly, his feet beginning to sink slowly in the quaking soil. Turn back. Turning, he scanned the shore south, his feet sinking again slowly in new sockets. The cold domed room of the tower waits. Through the barbicans, the shaft of light are moving ever, slowly, ever, as my feet are sinking, creeping duskward on the dial floor. Blue dusk, nightfall, deep blue night. In the darkness of the dome they wait. Their pushed-back chairs, my obelisk valise, around a board of abandoned platters. Who to clear it? He has the key. I will not sleep there when this night comes, a shut door of a silent tower, entombing their blind bodies... The panther sahib and his pointer call. No answer. He lifted his feet up from the suck and turned back by the mole of boulders. Take all, keep all. My soul walks with me, form of forms. So in the moon's mid-watches I pace the path above the rocks in sable silvered, hearing Elsinore's tempting flood. The flood is following me. I can watch it flow past from here. Get back then by the pool beg road to the strand there. He climbed over the sedge and ely oar weeds and sat on a stool of rock 
resting his ass, ash plant in a grike. A bloated carcass of a dog lolled on the bladder rack. Before him, the gunwale of a boat sunk in sand. Un coche en sable. Louis Villot called Gautier's prose. These heavy sands are language tied in wind have silted our language tied in wind have silted here and these the stone heaps of dead builders a warren of weasel rats hide gold there try it you have some sands and stones heavy of the past sir lout's toys mind you don't get one bang on the air i'm the bloody well gigant rolls all them bloody well boulders bones for my stepping stones fee for fum i smell the bloods of the irishman a point. Live dog grew into sight running across the sweep of sand. Lord, is he going to attack me? Respect his liberty. You will not be master of others or their slave. I have my stick. Sit tight. From farther away, walking shoreward across from the crested tide. Figures. Two. The two marriers. They have tucked it safe among the bulrushes. Peekaboo, I see you. No, the dog, he is running back to them. Who? Gullies of the Lucklands ran here to the beach in quest of prey, their blood beaked prows riding low on a molten pewter surf. Dane Vikings, talks of tomahawks a glitter on their breasts when Malachi wore the colour of gold. A school of tailhide whales stranded in hot noon, spouting, hobbling in the shallows. Then from the starving cage-work city, a horde of jerkined dwarves, my people, with flayer's knives, running, scaling, hacking in green blubbery whale meat. Famine, plague, and slaughters, their blood is in me, their lusts my waves. I moved among them on the frozen liffy, that I, a changeling, among the sputtering resin fires. I spoke to no one, none to me. The dog's bark ran towards him, stopped, ran back, dog of my enemy. I just simply stood pale, silent, bared about. Terabilia meditans, a primrose doublet, fortune's nerve, smiled on my fear. For that are you pining, the bark of their applause. Pretenders live their lives. The Bruce's brother, Thomas Fitzgerald, silken knight, Perkin Warbeck, York's false scion, in breeches of silk, of white rose ivory, wonder of a day. And Lambert Simnel, with a tail of nuns and sutlers, a scullion crowned. All king's sons, a paradise of pretenders then and now. He saved men from drowning, and you shake at a cur's yelping. But the courtiers who mocked Guido, or in awe Saint-Michel were in their own house. House of, we don't want any of your medieval abstrusiosities. Would you do what he did? A boat would be near, a life buoy. Naturalique, put there for you. Would you or would you not? The man that was drowned nine days ago off Maiden's Rock. They're waiting for him now. The truth spit it out, I would want to. I would try. I am not a strong swimmer. Water cold, soft. When I put my face into it, in the basin it clone glows, can't see. Who's behind me? Out quickly, quickly. Do you see the tide flowing quickly in on all slides, sheeting the loads of sand quickly? Shell cuckoo are coloured. If I had land under my feet, I want his life still to be his, mine to be mine. A drowning man, his human eyes scream to me out of horror of his death. I, with him together down, I could not save her. Waters, bitter death, lost. A woman and a man. I see her skirties, pinned up by bet. The dog ambled about a bank of dwindling sand, trotting, sniffing on all sides looking for something lost in a past life, suddenly made off like a bounding hare, ears flung back, chasing the shadow of a low-skimming gull. The man's shrieked whistle struck his limp ears. 
He turned, bounded back, came nearer, trotted on twinkling shanks. On a field tenny a buck, trippant proper, unattired. At the lace fringe of the tide, he halted with stiff forehoofs, sea award pointed, seaward pointed ears, his snout lifted, barked at the wave noise, herds of sea morse. They serpented towards his feet, curling, unfurling many crests, every ninth breaking, plashing from far, from farther out, waves and waves, cockle pickers. They waded a little way in the water and, stooping, soused their bags and, lifting them again, waded out. The dog yelped, running to them, reared up and pawed them, dropping on all fours, again reared up at them with mute, bearish fawning. Unheeded, he kept by them as... They came towards the drier sand, a rag of wolf's tongue, red panting from his jaws. His speckled body ambled ahead of them and then loped off at a calf's gallop. The carcass lay on his path. He stopped, sniffed, stalked round it. Brother, nosing closer, went round it, sniffing rapidly like a dog all over the dead dog's bedraggled fell. Dog skull, dog sniff, eyes on the ground, moved to one's great goal. Ah, poor dog's body. Here lies poor dog body's body. Tatters, out of that, you mongrel! Cry brought him skulking back to his master, and a blunt, bootless kick sent him unscathed across a split of sand. <laughs> Crouched in flight. He slunk back in a curve. Doesn't see me. Along by the edge of the mole, he lolloped, dawdled, smelt a rock, and from under a cocked hind leg, pissed against it. He trotted forward, and lifting again his hind leg, pissed quick short at an unsmelt rock. Simple pleasures of the poor. His hind paws then scattered the sand. Then his forepaws dabbled and delved. Something he buried there, his grandmother. He rooted in the sand again with the fury of his claws soon ceasing, a pard, a panther, gotten spouse breached, vulturing the dead. That's my favorite. After he woke me last night, the same dream, or was it? Wait, open hallway, street of harlots. Remember? Harun al Rashid? I am almosting it. That man led me, spoke. I was not afraid. The melon he had he held against my face. Smiled. Cream fruit smell. That was the rule, said. In come. Red carpet sprayed. You will see who. Shouldering their bags, they trudged the red Egyptians. His blued feet out of turned-up trousers slapped the clammy sand, a, du a dull brick muffler strangling his unshaven neck. With woman's steps she followed, the ruffian in his strolling mort. Spoils slung at her back, loose sand and shell grit crusted her bare feet, about her with windrow face hair trailed. Behind her lord, his helpmate, being a wasp to Romeville. When night hides her body's flaws, calling under her brown shawl from an archway where dogs have mired. Her fancy way is treating two royal Dublins in a lufflands of black pits. Buzz her, rapping rogues rum lingo, or oh, oh, my dimber wapping dell, a she fiend's whiteness under her rancid rags. From Bally's lay in the night, the tanyard smells. White thy fambles, red thy gown, and thy quarren's dainty ease. Couch a hog's head with me then, in the dark man's clip and kiss. Moros delitaction, Aquinas turnbelly calls this. Frate porcospino. Unfallen Adam rode and not rotted. Call away, let them, thy quarren's dainty ease. Language no whit worse than his. Monk words, merry beads jabber on their girdles. Rogue words, tough nuggets putter in their pockets. Passing now. A side eye at my hamlet hat. If I were suddenly naked here as I sit, I am not. Across the sands of all the world, followed by the sun's flaming sword to the west, trekking to evening lands. She trudges, schleps, trains, drags, trascenes her load, a tide westering, moon-drawn in her wake. Tides myriad islanded within her, blood not mine. Oinopa ponton, 
a wine-dark sea. Behold the handmaid of the moon. In sleep the wet sign calls her hour, bids her rise. Bride-bed, child-bed, bed of death, ghost-candled. Omnis caro ad te veniet. He comes, pale vampire, through storm his eyes. His back sails bloodying the sea, mouth to her mouth's kiss. Here, put a pin in that chap, will you, my tablets? Mouth to her kiss. No, must be two of them. Glue em well, mouth to her mouth's kiss. His lips, lipped and mouthed, fleshless lips of air. Mouth to her moomb, oomb, all wombing tomb. His mouth, molded, issuing breath. Unspeached, ooey ha. Roar of cataractic planets, globed, blazing, roaring, way away, away, away. Paper. Banknotes, blast them! Old Deezy's letter, here. Thanking you for the hospitality, tear the blank end off. Turning his back to the sun, he bent over far to a table of rock and scribbled words. That's twice I forgot to take slips from the library counter. His shadow lay over the rocks as he banked, ending. Why not endless till the... Uh -oh. Uh oh, oh no. Uh oh. Why not endless till the farthest star? Darkly they are there behind this light, darkness shining in the brightness, delta of Cassiopeia, world. Me sits there with his augur's rod of ash, in borrowed sandals, by day beside a livid sea, unbeheld in violet night, walking beneath a rain of uncouth stars. I throw this ended shadow from me, man-shape ineluctable, call it buck. Endless, would it be mine, form of my form? Who watches me here? Who does? Whoever anywhere will read these written words. Signs on a white field, somewhere to someone in your flutiest voice. The good bishop of Cloyne took the veil of the temple out of his shovel hut. Veil of space with coloured emblems hatched on its field. Hold hard. Coloured on a flat. Yes, that's right. Flat I see. Then think distance. Near. Far. Flat I see. East. Back. Ah, uh, see now. Falls back suddenly. Frozen in stereoscope. Click does the trick. You find my words dark. Darkness is in our souls, do you not think? Flute here. Our souls, shame wounded by our sins, cling to us yet more. A woman to her lover clinging, the more, the more. She trusts me, her hand, gentle, the long-lashed eyes. Now where the blue hell am I bringing her beyond the veil? Into the ineluctable modality of the ineluctable visuality. She, she, she. What she? The virgin at Hodges Figgis Widows on Monday? Looking in for one of the alphabet books you were going to write? Keen glance you gave her. Wrist through the braided jessie of her sunshade. She lives in Leeson Park with the grief and kickshaws, a lady of letters. Talk that to someone else. Stevie, a pick-me-up. Bet she wears those curse of God stays suspenders and yellow stockings darned with lumpy wool. Talk about apple dumplings. Piutosto, where are your wits? Touch me. Soft eyes, soft, soft, soft hand. I'm lonely here. Oh, touch me soon, now. What is that word known to all men? I'm quiet here, alone. Sad, too. Touch, touch me. He lay back at a full stretch over the sharp rocks, cramming the scribbled note and pencil into a pock his hat, his hat down on his eyes. That is Kevin Egan's movement I made, nodding for his nap, Sabbath sleep. Et vidit dus, et errant valde bona. Allo, bonjour. Welcome as the flowers in May. Under its leaf, he watched through peacock-twittering lashes 
the southing sun. I am caught in this burning scene, Pan's hour, the faunal noon, Among gum-heavy serpent plants, Milk-oozing fruits, Where on the tawny waters leaves lie wide, Pain is far. And no more turn aside and brood. His gaze brooded on his broad-toed boots, A box cast off, neighbor nine under. He counted the creases of rock's leather, Wherein another's foot had nestled warm. The foot that beat the ground in tripudium, Foot I dislove. But you were delighted When Esther Oswald's shoe went on you. Girl I knew in Paris. Tiens, quel petit pied! Staunch framed a brother soul, Wild's love that dare not speak its name. His arm, Cranley's arm, He now will leave me, And the blame, as I am, As I am, All or not at all. In long lassoes from the cook lake the water flowed full, covering green gold in the lagoons of sand, rising, flowing. My ash plant will float away. I shall wait. No, they will pass on, passing, chafing against the low rocks, swirling, passing. Better get this job over quick. Listen, a four worded wave speech. See su hiss. Precise ooze. Vehement breath of waters amid sea snakes, rearing horses, rocks. In cups of rocks it slops, flop, slop, slap, bounded in barrels, and spent its speech ceases. It flows purling, widely flowing, floating, flame pool, flower unfurling. Under the upswelling tide he saw the writhing weeds lift languidly and sway reluctant arms, hising up their petticoats in whispering water, swaying and upturning coy silver fronds. Day by day, night by night, lifted, flooded, and let fall. Lord, they are weary, and, whispered too, they sigh. St. Ambrose heard it, sighs of leaves and waves, waiting, awaiting the fullness of their times. Dibus at noctibus inurius patiens in gemiscuch. To no end gathered, vainly then released, forth flowing, wending back, loom of the moon. Weary too in sight of lovers, lascivious men, and naked women, women, shining in her courts. She draws a toil of waters. Five fathoms out there. Full fathom five thy father lies. At one, he said. Found drowned. High water at Dublin Bar. Driving before it a loose drift of rubble. Fan shoals of fishes, silly shells. A corpse rising salt white from the undertow. Bobbing a pace, a pace, a porpoise landward. There he is. Hook it quick. Pull. Sunk though he be beneath the watery floor, we have him. Easy now. Bag of corpse gas sopping in foul brine. A quiver of minnows. Fat of a spongy tidbit. Flash through the slits of his button trouser fly. God becomes man, becomes fish, becomes barnacle. Goose becomes featherbed mountain. Dead breaths I living breathe. Tread dead dust devours a uranus offal from all dead. Hauled stark over the gunwale, he breathes upward the stench of his green grave, his leprous nose hole snoring to the sun. A sea change, this, brown eyes salt blue, sea death, mildest of all deaths known to man. Old Father Ocean, pre de Paris, beware of imitations. Just you give it a fair trial. We enjoyed ourselves immensely. Come, I thirst, clouding over. No black clouds anywhere, are there? Thunderstorm. All bright he falls, proud lightning of the intellect. Lucifer, Dico, Ki, Nezkit, Okasum. No. My cockle hat and staff and his my sandal shoe. Where? To evening lands. Evening will find itself. He took the hilt of his ash plant, 
lunging with it softly, dallying still, yes, evening will find itself in me, without me. All days make their end. By the way, next, when it is Tuesday, will be the longest day of all the glad new year, mother, the rum-tum tiddly-tum, lawn Tennyson, gentleman poet, G-I-A, Gia, for the old hag with the yellow teeth, and Monsieur Drummond, gentleman journalist, Gia, my teeth are very bad. Why, I wonder, feel. That one is going to shells. Ought I go to a dentist, I wonder, with that money? That one? This? Toothless Kinch, the Superman. Why is that, I wonder? Or does it mean something, perhaps? My handkerchief. He threw it, I remember. Did I not take it up? His hand groped vainly in his pockets. No, I didn't. Better buy one. He laid the dry snot picked from his nostril on a ledge of rock, carefully. For the rest, let look who will. Behind, perhaps there is someone. He turned his face over a shoulder, rear regardant, moving through the air high spars of a three-master, the sails brailed up on the cross trees, homing upstream, silently moving, a silent ship. End of chapter 3